fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the House of Mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. Heard on FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 1050 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. I'm Al Warren. Mr. Dave Martino is here with his baseball bats. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a baseball player, Al. Oh, come on. It's a diff- that's a different guy. It's a different Don't guy. Don't you wrecking my fantasy here. <laughs> I mean, you gotta be. You gotta be. That's why. That's why I, I found. I said I wanted a celebrity. Yeah. Go host. I and they said, well, we've got this baseball player, this Martino oh. guy, and he's he's good. He's real. Got it on false pretenses. Now and now I'm really. Oh, I'm depressed now. <laughs> Can he even play baseball? No. <laughs> oh boy. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe I could now. Well, we can still get cheap hotels, you know, under that name. <laughs> yeah. so I think, you know, first class, they got to get the baseball player first class hotel, right? We're going to do it. Yeah. 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 Let's uh, get this week going now. This week we are talking to a lot of authors and it's mainly true crime. Today is sort of on the edge. It's crime fiction. But uh, we're going to be talking about a book called 1033, Assist PC, a Mike O'Shea novel by Desmond P. Ryan. So thanks for being here, Des. Oh, thanks for inviting me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Des, where did it all start for you? <laughs> what hospital was it you were born in? <laughs> no, I mean, how did you get into um, to writing these uh, undercover crime fiction sort of novels? Well, uh, I was a, a police officer in Toronto, up here in Canada, uh, for almost 30 years. And when I retired, well, a little bit before I retired, I thought, I don't want to be that guy that sits in the corner of the pub and talks to everybody about all this police stories, so I should write some of these down. And so that's how the whole idea of uh, writing the Mike O'Shea series started. So you can sit in a bookstore and tell people all about these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and now I can sit here with you and tell these stories. Yeah, yeah. That's that's fun. You got into policing, and you were policing in in the big T.O., Toronto. What do you think about being a policeman and that in these modern days? Would you want to be a a cop today? Well, it's funny, um, because when I came on in 1987, uh, the guys that were had been on for 20, 30 years, uh, they just kept saying, the job's fun. Oh, my. And now... All these years later, I'm like, oh, man, it's a totally different job. It's very much a generational job. And so the way policing is done now is very different from the way it was done when I started. So I I think I've kind of dinosaured myself out. Do you find it, um, the people that um, know you're a cop or were a policeman, is there... Is there kind of a negativity in, in, let's say, in Canada toward police as there is in the U.S.? Like in America right now, there's a real, you know, a line drawn, you know, Blue Lives Matter and and all this sort of stuff. And then there's there's a lot of tension. Uh, Do you feel that's the same way up in, in Canada or not? I think it is to a degree. I mean, I can't speak for it today because I retired about six years ago, but the the line was starting to get drawn in the sand then. Having said that, I remember when I started in the 80s, um, and I told my uh, left-wing beatnik friends that I was becoming a cop, I lost a lot of my left-wing beatnik friends. But I don't think it's it's, it's quite as strong as it is today. Yeah, because I think back then the beatniks were thinking it's, you know, it's uncool. You know, you're you're a pig, baby, and you're, it's uncool, right? Oh, yeah, I, yeah. It, it was a different sort of sense. I think there's a real anger right now towards policing. Uh, well, especially you know, with the U.S., because the U.S., the black relations are not the best with police 
certainly in the media. So yeah, it's it's not quite the same. What, what what do you think? Um, being a cop all those years, you learned, or 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 I guess, how do you think it's changed you as a person? Well, um, I mean, there's, there's kind of two sides to that coin. On the one hand, I had the best seats to the greatest show on earth. Um, I mean, I got to see so many things, good and bad. Um, and I got to see people mostly at their worst, but you get right into the thick of people's lives and it's really, really interesting. The, the flip side of that is that it can kind of warp you a little bit. Um, we talk a lot about, uh, you know, gallows humor. I mean, that's the live, that's alive and well because you can't possibly go through, uh, the types of experiences that any, anybody in, in a frontline environment goes through. And I mean, you, you either lose your mind, become incredibly cynical or hysterically funny through gallows humor. Yeah. I've gone that way. <laughs> <laughs> I, but when you say that, um, you see people at their worst. So does that, over a period of years, make it so that even when you're off, you're not you're not a cop, and you go out to a store, or you go to a um, whatever. You're you're just out in public. Do you sort of spot and naturally look for things that people are doing that are wrong? You know, even if it's you're not intentional, it's just part of your training. You just sort of spot things. All of a sudden, someone's uh, you know stealing something or doing something that's not let's say legal or correct does that sort of happen naturally after doing that oh absolutely i mean it's it's um it's something you you, you can't really turn off because you're trained to look for certain things and if you do that enough um then that's all you see and that's one of the challenges i think for police officers i, I mean i can speak to police officers um to that experience is that you know being able to kind of step step down and sort of remind yourself you're off duty somebody else is looking after this it's not your responsibility you know so if something happens uh like today for example i was driving home i'm getting my hair cut and a cement truck had had rolled over uh on the other side of the road people had stopped it was being looked after but my my impulse was to pull over get out and make sure the driver was okay Clearly, he was okay. It had been dealt with. The police were on their way. It wasn't me. But I had to remind myself, it's not you. Just get on your way home. Yeah, I guess it would be tough drawing that line between being like an officer and just being a good person. You know, kind of there's that. You have to kind of under, understand where that line is and stuff like that. Unless, of course, you're Bruce Willis in a Die Hard movie. <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. And then you're like totally yeah. dead all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I was going to do that. I was actually I was going to hop out. I was going to flip the tow truck or the, the cement truck back up yeah. and then get back in my car. But I thought, no, I'll, I'll oh, leave that for somebody money. else. To. Yeah. You didn't want to mess your new hairdo. Well, that's it. You know, you, <laughs> the hair that I have, as as all of your listeners can see, you know, it takes a, a while to look like this. Yeah. Well, there you go. Uh, you said it first. <laughs> well, it, well, speaking of Bruce Willis and that, do you, do you think that... Um, Police are portrayed very well in in movies and TV and even books and and stuff like that. Like you've got a, a book out now, and we're talk about that. Do, do you think in general, uh, cops are portrayed well in in media? You know, it's it's difficult because everybody has their own their own brand. So I mean, a lot of a lot of police work is really boring. It's you know sitting waiting for things to happen. It's documenting what has happened. It's waiting for your documentation to do something about what's happened, um, and that makes for a really boring Bruce Willis movie. If you're going to see an action movie, obviously the police are going to be portrayed in an action kind of way. In in TV shows, same thing. And so it's hard to find that balance between sort of reality and excitement. So now your new book, it's. Um... 1033 assist pc now that you call it a mike o'shea novel so obviously this is like a series uh, or a person you're you're going to make a series of and stuff like that so who is mike o'shea uh, the, the the book is uh the first in a six book story arc and so at the end of the six books uh, i'm either going to have to come up with something clever to do with mike o'shea or that's the end of him 
and his his cast of of merry people. Now, basically, what happens is this book takes place in two thousand five, and it was intended just to be sort of a, a prequel to the the second book that's coming out in April, which is Death Before Coffee. And so, I just kind of wanted to give a little of backstory to what happens in Death Before Coffee. Got carried away, ended up writing this book, and so what happens here is that Mike and his team are working in the juvenile uh, prostitution um, section of of the police, and they are on the verge of cracking a juvenile prostitution ring, and they get burned, and sort of all sorts of excitement ensues, and the rest of the series deals with how these officers navigate through their lives, both personally and professionally, and hopefully at the end are able to resolve the issues that start in the first book. Well, I, I, I have to ask, because you were a cop, how much of your own experiences as a cop would go into Micaché? Well, for legal purposes, I have to say this is completely fiction, and I made it all up. Um, but <laughs> suffice it to say, um, again, for me, it was very cathartic. It was writing about uh, experiences that I had had been involved in or had information about, and it was writing about, um, for legal purposes, people that I've never met before, uh, but the types of people that I worked with and the experiences and relationships I had with those experiences, or with those people, rather. So I like to think that it's fairly realistic with a little bit of a twist, so we can call it fiction, and I don't get sued. <laughs> well, you know, you were, t- you were talking about boring police work, and I'm just wondering... Um, how how do you strike the balance between the realities of police work and law enforcement and giving readers the the excitement that they that they want and that does I, I, I assume happen things go from kind of zero to sixty at times in fields like that so I'm just wondering how you how you strike that balance well again you have to um at least what I'm trying to do um, in my books, is is that exactly that, that balance. So there's times where they're just kind of sitting around. And the great thing about writing is you can use that for character development, as opposed to you just have two guys sitting in a car watching an address saying nothing for 30 pages. Because I, you know, 30 blank pages, I think, I think my, my publisher would have some issues <laughs> with that. So you get a little bit of banter back and forth. And in a novel, you're compressing, uh, you know, months or years of relationship into a very short span of time. So, as a literary device, I can use that downtime uh, to build their relationships. Well, what made you go into writing after being a cop? Other than, of course, the idea of of telling your stories and stuff like that, but to actually do it rather than to think about it. Um, what, what was the initial, uh, you know, the the push or the thing that happened that made you go, yeah, I'll do it? Because there's a big difference, like I said, and to actually write it and then send it to publishers and and have them read it and and get it out there for the for the for the public. What, what drew that? What what got you going on that? I think it was probably um, a combination of arrogance and stupidity. Which is to say, it was just, I'll just write this and I'll send it to a publisher and it'll be great. Uh, what I didn't realize was that, well, I kind of did, but I didn't listen to that voice in my head, was that the publishers aren't sitting there waiting to hear what Desmond P. Ryan has to say about anything, and nor were any agents. So it took uh, several years. Um, it's kind of like speed dating gone bad. Uh, of sending out all kinds of of, um, of requests and things to, to get agents to read my stuff um, before somebody finally said yes. And by that time, I just thought, you know, I've started this series. I'm just going to keep writing it. And that way, when somebody does say yes, I'll be ready. And that's how that happened. Well, I'm wondering how it was um, going from uh, writing within law enforcement police uh, police work, uh, writing reports, uh, the who, what, where, when, and how type of writing to uh, transitioning to creative writing. How was that for you? Was was that difficult, or did you find that was easy, or was it something that you had done before? Well, you know, Dave, what happens there is 
you get to make stuff up, which is great. <laughs> and you get to have the ending that you want. And so in a lot of ways, it became cathartic for me until it got darker. Um, but it was being able to tell a story and it working out the way I wanted. In real life, uh, in police writing you know, reports and, and synopsises for guilty pleas and things like that, it doesn't work out the way you want. And the happy ending isn't usually that happy. So being able to write creatively was was a lot of fun for me. So really, um, that could be your your choice of writing a fictional story rather than nonfiction over your policing time or real real life is because, in a sense, you can achieve justice or the justice appears to happen in fiction books, whereas a lot of times in nonfiction it doesn't. Well, that's that's it. And um, the other thing I considered was if you're writing nonfiction, you're writing about real people and real events. And in a lot of ways, nonfiction is, I, I think, is re-victimizing people again. I mean, I, I can't imagine how horrible it would be you know, sort of the first time around to to lose a family member through through violence and then just watch a recreation of that on Netflix. And I just didn't want to I didn't want to do right. that. Oh, true crime writers are the worst. <laughs> <laughs> and and they have to do a lot of research. So that, that's a lot of work. I, I just the stuff I don't know, I can just make up. So there's a whole lot less research because you have a lot already to draw from anyway. You kind yeah. of already know. And, and that's the other thing is that. um you know, for, for people who don't have a, a law enforcement or legal background, I mean, my, my hat is off to them for the amount of research they have to do for readers to follow along. And I mean, that's a lot, a lot of work. I don't think I would have written crime fiction if I didn't have a background in policing because I wouldn't have done that much work. Where did you get the inspiration for, for Mike O'Shea? What, do, you, do you like other detectives, you know, that have been fictionalized before? Well, I, I just kind of took him as, um, I mean, I'd like to say he's, he's a lot like me, but he's a lot more uh, lackluster than I am and a little bit braver. Um, but I just thought I, if I was going to write a series about a specific character, I should really like him, like him well enough um, to want to spend, you know, five or six or seven or 10 years telling his story you know, at my keyboard, and then however many years afterwards, um, talking to people about the character. So I created the character, and sort of as the series goes on, he gets, there's more depth to him because the reader learns more about him as I'm writing more into him. So in the first book, um, he's he's a young guy, and, and he's sort of full of piss and vinegar. The next book, he's in the latter stages of his policing career, much more kind of laid back um, just because he's been worn down by his experiences. And I wanted to have him as a worn down guy, but not a burnout. But does he have as good a hair as you? Yeah, I think he's probably got better hair. <laughs> he, he might have better hair. How much of yourself do you think goes into Mike? Well, I think in all of the characters, a writer puts a bit of themselves if they're writing fiction. And so I would think that, and maybe I'm just a really lazy writer, and I'll own that if that's true. Actually, I'll own it because it is true. Um, the, the characters that I spend the most time writing about, I just draw from my my observations and things through my eyes um, just because it's easier and I'm a lazy writer. Well, can, can you hear Mike? Do you, do you have, are you a type of writer who has an inner monologue? Can, can you hear the character or is there some other way that you experience this character and uh, write dialogue? Yeah, it's, it's kind of, um, I sometimes wonder if it's a bit unwell, but it's almost like sitting in a room where everybody's talking and I just try to type stuff down as quickly as possible and hope I get it all. And when I do the first draft, um, it's pretty much all dialogue. And then I go back and fill in sort of all the other stuff. But I hear dialogue first. It's like transcribing. Wow. So when you're writing a book about like this, the verge of cracking a prostitution ring, are you, you know, do these voices make you go out and 
hang out with the uh, <laughs> uh, the on on street workers or what goes on here? <laughs> uh, no, but I, I did that in my professional <laughs> career in my my younger days. So, uh, so th- there's no need to do any sort of uh, uh, that sort of thing now. It was it was all professional, by the way. Yeah, of course, <laughs> nothing but. Well, as, as long as those voices aren't telling you to do weird things. When you started writing and decided you were going to do this, um, is this is this been purely entertainment for you or is there something more you want someone to get from your books do you want the readers to understand more about policing well what i look at is um one of of the things i really liked about policing was that sense of having your finger on the pulse and that sense of getting a whole different understanding of people a more in-depth understanding um and uh, the possibility to look at things within a, a social awareness context and what i particularly like and i've noticed it in other crime fiction books as well is the opportunity to make social statements and commentary is there without whacking people over the head um and saying you know i am now going to talk about you know um hiring and equity i'm now going to talk about the glass ceiling i'm now going to talk about the old boys club but you can put all of that stuff in without saying it uh in as many words and so as the series progresses i i look at more social issues and uh like issues of discrimination whether it's uh you know gender based or um sexual orientation based um again without saying you know this is a a feminist novel right so it's kind of it's kind of wove into the story and not so much uh like a direct analysis or something of society you know um so when you when you know you're doing the series or are you the person that um has this all outlined and structured ahead of time before you get into the writing yeah i'm i'm a i'm a plotter i'm, a, I'm kind of a cheater plotter um because i'll <laughs> I'll come up with the with the book outline and just kind of do a little synopsis for each chapter. And then I think I'm really, really clever because I've got it all done. And then I look at it, well, I'll just fill in the blanks. But as I go, sometimes the characters kind of go off on some little tangent on their own way, and I have to pull them back. And so I have to look at a way of doing that without making it look like, you know, you just turned the page and the guy's, you know, suddenly doing something completely different. So I think I've got it all plotted. I think I know what's going to happen. But sometimes the characters shift things and change change things a little bit and expand some areas that I didn't think I was going to get into. And some of the stuff I thought was really great um, just may not fall into place. So I kind of cheat. They, they become kind of alive <laughs> and take over. Yeah. Well, well in, in the... Um, Mike O'Shea novels, I threw in a character um, who's Mike O'Shea's mom, and her name's Mary Margaret O'Shea, and I threw her in just because the the story was was fairly intense. It was getting heavy. Uh, it was getting like, a little more, a little darker than I wanted it to go. So I threw her in just for a little bit of levity, and after I think about the second or third book, um, that some of the people that were doing the reading of it said she should have her own series. She's really, really great. And I found that she was way more fun to write. And I was writing more of her into the police procedural. So I ended up writing a whole light mystery slash cozy series with Mary Margaret O'Shea. That's become a whole series unto itself. So now I, so I have two series going, but she's the perfect example of a character who got out of hand. Well, wow. with with all these series, how, how do you keep track of continuity over whether it's the six books of of um, of, of this other series or uh, do you, do you have tools? Do you have a series bible? How does that work? Uh, no, I don't, and I don't have a a bible that, and I I know I should, and sometimes I think, oh man, I wish I'd written that down, and then I'll decide to to start writing down all of these things. And then it just annoys me because then I'll have to look them up. So I just kind of muddle through, and hopefully it works. And um, I I also have uh, a few editors that I 
I fall back on who will say, wait a minute, didn't this, you know, character do this back here? And how is, how are they now able to do that? So good editors help. So was Mary O'Shea, uh, was she a, a prostitute? No, Mary Margaret is Mike's mom. <laughs> She's the Irish, the Irish mother. <laughs> well, I knew she was the mother, but I was yeah, just no, finding no, out. <laughs> no, no, she is the uh, the Irish mother who who makes sure that everybody does what they're supposed to do and is a little bit overbearing. And so I had to write her out of the books because she was just getting too big for her, her britches. Oh, so you put her down. <laughs> That's right. Put her down into another book. So she just makes cameos now. <laughs> Well, when you're, but that, that brings up because you're, when you're writing a, um, an evil character or a bad character, or if you have someone in there that's doing something wrong, you know, the murderer or whatever the case is, um, how do you put together that character? Like, where, where does it come from? Well, a lot of those characters are, uh, compilations of people that I have dealt with in my professional career. Um, And the challenge with that is that as I'm putting them together, as I'm going through the scenes, as I'm writing them out, is I don't want to go into that dark place. Um, Yeah, it's like I've I've already I've already dealt with that professionally. I don't want to go back there. So I find that I have to have some sort of real mental health tricks up my sleeve uh, after writing a really heavy scene to be able to kind of get up, do something else, and come back without getting you know really depressed and, and, and into despair. So what's your favorite thing about writing? I like that. Uh, I like that I can make stuff happen. I like that. I can take these, these characters that are completely made up in my mind and put them down. And all of a sudden on some level, they become real. And that, that's kind of a, a neat thing. It just kind of blows my mind actually. And what, what's the thing you dislike most about writing? Actually writing. <laughs> it's a, you know, if you could kind of just click your heels and come up with a book, it'd be great. Um, it's the sitting down, but I, that's not quite true because um, you know, when I sit down and I, again, I, I, I can thank my police training for this. I used to do a lot of writing. I mean, every radio call you went to, um, you'd have to do a report. And, you know, there's no such thing as the report muse. It's like, write the report, get it done. When I was a detective, um, you know, I had to write longer reports and things for people to go to court. And if you had, you know, 10 people that had to get to court during your shift, you're typing the whole time. You just go, 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 go. Um, and again, there's none of this. Well, I just don't feel it today. And I just, I just can't string my words together. It's like, doesn't matter. Do it. And so I find when I'm actually sitting down, I can sit for two or three hours and, you know, hammer out a thousand words, 1500 words. And that's great. But then just kind of think like, okay, well, I just have to sit down, but it's a discipline to say, okay, every day I'm going to sit down. And that's how you write a book. So what makes a good book for you? I really like the characters. Um, because when you think about it, I mean, there's only so much that can happen and there's only, I mean, yes, there's all sorts of little twists, but it's buying into the characters that I really like. And, Having characters that are a little larger than life, but not over the top. So they're, you know, not sort of mundane, but they're not so out there that you would never, ever believe them. So I think of um, the River series of of Ben Abramovich, his series, and the characters are really quite interesting and just at that edge of, suspension of belief so uh, what what came first for you um was it the the characters the story or the setting ah uh, i think it was the characters because again i look at um well if you take a, a murder mystery it's pretty straightforward somebody gets killed somebody investigates it somebody gets caught the end and now you have about eighty thousand more words to fill in and so I know there are some writers who are really, really good with descriptors and you just get drawn into uh, the environment. I'm not that writer. I think my strength is in dialogue and in characters. And so that's, I just kind of let the, the characters start talking and then away we go with the stories on the move. And so do you ever write in first person or how do, how do you write it from what character point of view? No, I've never done first person. I I admire writers who can. 
I think to do it first person, you have to have a really interesting main character. And in doing that, you also have to be really careful not to kind of flip into some omnipresent thing. I I like being able to flip points of views between sort of the characters a little bit, but mostly having that uh, omnis- omnipotent, omniscient, omnipotent narrator. Ooh, say that ten times fast. <laughs> I could even say it once. So the, the, the third party, I believe it's called. Every, every time you finish a book, what do you think it does for you? How does it change you? When I finish a book, I start the next one right away. And I think that's because I don't want to give myself time to ruminate. Because I think it'd be easy to finish the book, let it sit, and then sort of get thinking too much about it. I very much have taken my my police training of like on to the next call into the way I write books. Interesting. So who are your favorite writers? Or do you have any? Oh, I, you know, my all-time favorite writer, of course, it was, is Charles Dickens, because... I love characters. I love how no matter how minor a character he writes, it's a complete little person. And his ability to discuss social issues um, and move things along, again, that seem very realistic but are a little bit on the verge of absurd. And he does that in all of his novels. I mean, they're super long novels, but nonetheless, it's it's worth the price of admission. So I got to say, he's he's my favorite. Do you like reading outside of your own genre into different other, other categories? Well, you know, Alan, I'm a really slow reader, like ridiculously slow reader. So uh, I have friends who will read a book in an afternoon or, you know, on a weekend, it takes me a very long time to read. So if I'm going to read something, it has to be kind of worth my two, three week investment of time because I'm that slow. Um, But for right now, I find I'm reading a lot of crime fiction novels, um, mostly just to see how writers do what they do and how I can do what I do better. Right, right, yeah. It's an um, interesting field. Um, you know, I always listen to them. You know, I listen to a lot of books. Yeah, I, I tell people I, I tell people I'm I'm reading a book, and then I, I always have to put in brackets, uh, you know, who am I kidding? I'm listening to this book, and it's really good. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's the same. If you can't see or read as well, it's, I, I like listening to books, um, especially nowadays because they're pretty good, most of them. You know, narrators and stuff are, are really good. So it turns out pretty good. Um, wow. So now do you are, have a social media um, presence and do you have a website and all that? How do, how do you like to act or interact with people? I do. Um, I have a website, realdesmondryan.com. And I have a Twitter account, Real Desmond Ryan. There's kind of a theme going on here. Um, and, um, let's see, I'm on, I'm on Insta as Desmond P. Ryan. Thought I'd like break away from that theme. Yeah. And, uh, that's, that's about it. Um, I mean, pre, pre COVID, I was, um, involved in doing a lot of library talks, uh, about crime fiction in general. And now that I've got the book out, I'm looking forward to, to, um, to getting back out because I, I just, I really like talking about my book. I really like talking to people about what books they read. And it's a lot of fun. Very different from uh, talking to pe- people in a policing context. Of course, we'll have all of that up on our website so people can find you real easily. Um, how, so how was it writing over pandemic? I'd imagine you must have done some of that. Yeah, actually, that was really, really challenging because, I mean, I'm, I'm sure a lot of your listeners had big challenges during the pandemic. So, I mean, everybody's challenge was bad and well, maybe some people's weren't, but anyway, I was going through a very dark, dark place. And I found when I was writing the Mike books, um, the Mike O'Shea books, they got really, really dark and I didn't want to go there. So that's when I focused more on writing the Mary Margaret light mystery books um, because she's fun and irrelevant and, you can make all sorts of stuff up because 
it's a, a light mystery and you can get away with that, whereas you can't do it in a police procedural. So I found I had to step away um, and do something completely different because it was just way too dark and I was in too dark a place at that time. Yeah, yeah. I can. Uh, you didn't want your your fiction book, crime fiction book, to be so dark, I guess. You know, that could be um, kind of a hard thing. It's better to make Mary that way. <laughs> <laughs> well played, well played. And this is why you have your own show. Well, I have my moments, let's just say. Well, that's interesting. Well, I really appreciate you being here, and it's been a, a real pleasure. Now, the book, of course, is called 1033, Assist PC, and it's a Mike O'Shea novel, and the author has been our guest, Mr. Desmond P. Ryan. Thank you for being here. Oh, thanks. It was a lot of fun. Thanks, Des. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.